Today, the golden ratio's use in the Parthenon has been largely discredited. But Manolis Chorus and most scholars believe another ratio does in fact appear in much of the building. The width is, for instance, 30 meters and 80 centimeters. The length is 69 meters and 51 centimeters, the ratio being 4 to 9. The 4 to 9 ratio is also found between the width of the columns and the distance between their centers and the height of the facade to its width. The Parthenon, like a statue, exemplifies a certain symmetry, a certain harmony of part to part and of part to the whole. There's no question that the harmony of the building, which is clearly one of its most visible characteristics, is dependent upon a certain mathematical system of proportions. For the Greeks, there was nothing better than a design based on the coming together of measures, of proportions and harmonies and shapes. It's rather like an orchestrated piece of music in which the harmonies of the various instruments are, are sort of fused together in a wonderful, glorious, um, orchestrated symphony. With something like the Solomon Stone's use of the human body as units of measure and the idealized human form to define perfect proportions, the Parthenon literally embodies the words of the Greek philosopher Protagoras, who lived in Athens during the construction of the Parthenon. Man is the measure of all things. But proportions and principles do not a perfect Parthenon make. Kathy Paraski has been commuting to work on the Acropolis for 10 years. In all her time on the Parthenon restoration team, she's still amazed at one particular achievement of the ancients, their precision. We have a joint on the step of the Parthenon, which has been so thin, it's like 1 20th of a, of a millimeter, thinner than a hair. Further up, you cannot detect the joint at all. And finally, probably due to an earthquake, a crack starts from one block and continues to the other, and the two behave as one. This is the level of precision that the restorers need to match today. Their reconstructed column drum number 14192 was taken down because its base didn't fit. To achieve the required precision, they use metal smoothing plates, a technique based on ancient stone plates found on the Acropolis. It's a very traditional way to level a, a, a marble surface. Uh, we're putting sand in these holes and they just uh, move it on the top of the stone. They can make very small differences between the surfaces. Manolis Chorus believes the ancient stone sanding plates could grind to one twentieth of a millimeter. But to stack and precisely align the drums presents an additional challenge. Again, the modern restorers uncover an ancient technique when they separate these two column drums for the first time in 2,500 years. The ancients aligned the drums very simply, but again ingeniously. They had this block of wood that they cut in half. The lower part was inserted at the center of the lower drum, flush and perfectly fitted, and the upper part is centered in the upper drum coming down. So when the upper drum is placed, it centers onto this pin. The surface was perfectly connected, and it was so airtight that when we opened the drum, we found this, and it's 2,500 years old, intact. The cedar is so well preserved that restorers could still smell the wood put there by Pericles stonemasons. Today, the modern restorers use the same method, but with titanium.
But even though the restoration team has solved many details of the ancient's engineering secrets, they are still at a loss to answer the larger question. How did the Athenians build the Parthenon with all its subtle curves without an architectural plan? There's a simple problem that to get a plan of this size on a, at, at a reasonably small dimension that you can grapple with, something like this, which would be around 1 to 50 or so, that would be nowhere near precise enough to deal with all the subtle curvature and the minute adjustments that are also essential for this kind of project. One of the subtlest of these curves can be found on the Parthenon's columns. If we pull a string, we can see that from the middle of the column and up, we can see a curve, a very slight curve. The curve is gentle, starting a little less than halfway up and tapering again near the top. It's an optical refinement called entesis. Entesis means tension. It gives life to the column visually. It resembles an athlete trying to lift the weight, even the deep breath of the swelling of its chest. It is no longer dead stone. It has life in it, it has pulse. These deviations from the straight, from the perfectly vertical, from the perfectly horizontal, are analogous to the curvatures and the swellings and the irregularities of the human body. And in that sense, the Parthenon strikes me as being a sculptural as well as an architectural achievement. The entesis curve on the side of the column is so subtle and so slight, restorers can only draw it by computer. For the ancients to have drawn it at full scale, they would have had to set their compass at an impossible radius of nearly a mile. How they constructed the curved columns was one of the last great riddles left by the ancient Greek temple builders. The answer literally came to light at Didyma, 200 miles from Athens in what is today Turkey. Here, a team of German archaeologists was exploring the ruin of the Temple of Apollo. Built at the time of Alexander the Great, 150 years after the Parthenon, it was the biggest Greek temple ever conceived. 120 columns, each one more than twice the height of the Parthenon's. The German team noted an optical refinement, a curvature on the base of the temple, similar to that of the Parthenon. They suspected there might be more. Traversing the tunnel to the temple's sacred inner sanctum, open to the air, Lothar Hasselberger waited for his eyes to adjust. Coming out of the darkness of the tunnel into that white marble hall is a blinding experience. What then, to my surprise, came up were regularly incised horizontal lines. And I found them interesting enough to at least keep them in mind in order to return at a, at a time when everything was under better light conditions. So I was left wondering. At the mercy of the sun, Hasselberger would have to wait for just the right time of day for the light to reveal more of the mysterious lines. There is a golden time each day when the sunlight comes just about parallel to the surface. It was worth the wait. Coming back, again under better light conditions, it was a kind of revelation because I realized this is a full-sized vertical section of a column, the very one at the front of the temple. At just the right place in the temple of the sun god Apollo, at just the right time of day, he discovered what might be the answer to the riddle. An almost invisible, scaled-down version of the subtle entesis curve of the columns. 
This template represents a squashed column. Because it is impossible to draw the curve of the column in full size, the Greeks scaled down the height of the column by a factor of 16. Now, they had a curve that could be drawn with a large compass-like instrument. But the genius behind the template is that the width was not scaled down. So each horizontal line is still the radius of a full-scale column. Now, all a stonemason need do is set his compass to any line of the template to get the diameter of any corresponding point on the column. This simple scale drawing was a key reference for the stonemasons at Didyma as they carved one column drum after another. Greek stonemasons were so experienced in creating optical refinements like entesis that they may have been given relatively little guidance. The inscribed template survived at Didyma because the temple was destroyed by an earthquake and remained unfinished. But at the Parthenon, such lines probably disappeared when the walls were polished at the time of completion. Parthenon was finished, the marble surface is smooth and polished, and with it went what we uh, assume uh, were the construction lines of that temple. The modern restorers believe the ancient builders must have had some similar kind of template to produce the subtle curvature on not only the columns, but most of the Parthenon's marble blocks. The key problems are these amazing refinements, the curvature, the inclination, and so on. But once you've got them established, once you know with these blueprints exactly where you're going, then you can proceed down the length of the building and across the front by repetition. So once they get going, they can get going at considerable speed. With the discovery of the Didyma plans, the restorers have new insight into the last great secret of how the ancients built the Parthenon. But now they face the ultimate test as they place the drum they've so painstakingly reconstructed back on its column. With all its curves and angles, will this new column drum fit? It does. Yeah, you're very happy. <laughs> The restorers now need only apply a finished sanding to the most distinctive feature of the columns, the fluting. The crowning achievement will come with the placement of this 12-ton capital on top of the column shaft. For Cores and the modern restorers, this finished marble is more than just another piece of the jigsaw puzzle they feel they have successfully entered the minds of the ancient builders and discovered how Pericles and his architects were able to design and engineer the ideals of beauty and perfection into this monumental building. Using the same marble and similar techniques and tools, the Acropolis restoration team has reconstructed a part of the Parthenon perhaps as perfectly as the original builders. In the next 10 years, the work site will be empty and we will be able to admire the perfect proportions of the Parthenon again. The Parthenon was completed in 432 BCE. As the ultimate expression of Athenian ideals, the temple is adorned with mythological battles of victory, justice over injustice, civilization defeating barbarity, order prevailing over chaos. 
And perhaps for the first time on a Greek temple, the Athenians, mere mortals, depict themselves alongside the gods. And so if the human beings, if the Athenians on the Parthenon frieze are elevated near the rank of gods, the gods are represented in a way that makes them human. And the difference between gods and mortals, between Athenians and the Olympians, is not one so much of kind as of degree. This is an extremely humanistic way of representing themselves. But the temple and society that built it would not last. Just one year later, Heracles goes to the citizens of Athens for funds to equip an army against the threat of Sparta. To pay for it, he suggests they could, if necessary, strip the gold from the great statue of Athena. Soon after, Heracles and a third of the city die from the plague. Athens is crushed by the Spartans, who turn the Parthenon into an army barracks. For the next two millennia, the Parthenon would be abused by Romans, barbarians, Christians, Muslims, Turks, with the final insult coming in the 18th and 19th centuries, when Europeans rediscover classical Greece and out of reverence, plunder much of its remaining sculptures. The most famous of which, the Elgin Marbles, are in the British Museum to this day. When the Acropolis restoration project began over 30 years ago, Manolis Chorus and his colleagues could have chosen to restore the Parthenon to its original state, adorned with sculpture and friezes painted in vivid colors. Instead, they chose to preserve what has survived these 2,500 years, a majestic ruin a witness to what we needlessly destroy and the beauty and perfection that we can create. <laughs>